Okay, you were very young when the war broke out. And what I'd like to do is ask you to begin by describing the city of Vilna as it seemed to you as a, as a child. <clears throat> Vilna for me as a child. Now, you know, a child has no references. So uh, what he sees is, uh, is just his world. I mean, I, I remember living in very much in the center of town. Uh, I used to walk quite a lot with, uh, with a nanny. Um, what fascinated me most in Vilna, I think, were the churches and the sculptures that were uh, on the roofs of the churches all around. I remember these, uh, these very bizarre figures. What I loved were the pebbles of the streets. I remember, I remember that the streets were covered with, with pebbles. And, uh, and the mystery of the cracks in the sidewalks of the, of the, of the streets. I loved the bridges. The bridges were extraordinary because very often the water was frozen. And uh, in springtime, it used this, the ice used to break up. There was this incredible noise and, and all those big, enormous pieces of ice were floating under the bridges. I remember there was a beautiful hill with three crosses on the hill. And there was a sort of an ancient citadel. And we used to walk there on that little, on that little hill. Uh, I had no judgment, of course, whether it was a beautiful town, whether it was ancient or modern, and so on. Uh, I was fascinated by a shop of antiquities, which was just in the house where I lived. Down there were some old watches. Uh, I remember one of the most fascinating and frightening things every time I used to come out from our house was a little square in front of our house with the, with the uh, head of Maniuszko, who was a famous opera composer in Poland. Uh, there was this man with a little beard. He had no hands. He had no, no, no feet. He was on a pedestal, and I always looked at him in a very suspicious way. Uh, this is more or less what I, what I remember. Oh yes, there was something else very fascinating. Maybe now when I think about it, there were two men, two, 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 two figures of men, like caryatids, carrying a balcony on one of the buildings not far away. They were called, I think, something like Balvani or something like that. They were like that, carrying a balcony. And these fascinated me. I always thought, my goodness, it must be so tiring, you know, to carry a balcony on your head. Every time I passed there, they were there carrying that balcony. Also, you see, my, my, my memories of Vilna are just fragments, little fragments, bits and pieces. It's, it's not the, the look of Vilna. The first time I really had a view of Vilna was some time after that, in the ghetto, people were working on a model of the whole town of Vilna in miniature. And some friends of my parents used to work on every house. Every house in, 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 in that city was reproduced in a very small scale. And then this whole thing was uh, was existing like a, like a model, a huge model. Why the Germans needed that? I don't know, but I know that many people in the ghetto worked on that. And some of the friends of my parents worked on that. And they even brought sometimes to show us our house or some houses of, 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 of the friends that were in this scale. And this enormous model of, 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 of the town, it made you feel like a huge bird that flies over, over a city. And then I had a real view of Vilna. 
And I realized it years later that I brought in those small houses into my paintings. But it took me years to understand why I did that. It all had to do most probably with, uh, with, those, uh, with the image of the city in this reduced scale. Good. That you can stop tape for one moment. Stop tape. And speak. Tell us about your own family's roots in Vilna, and tell us a bit about various members of, of your family. How far back do they go as far as? Oh, I think that my, uh, my parents, my grandparents, my great-great-parents, they were all somehow part of the Jewish community of Vilna or a little from the surroundings of Vilna. Now, on my uh, father's side, the ones who are called Bak, Bak being the two letters of a longer name, which is Bnei Kdoshim, which means children of martyrs, which is a name given to the orphans of the pogroms of Kmelnitsky, which must, I think, go to the 17th century. So these are the, the bucks. Now, uh, I know that the par my great-grandparents, they were dealing in uh, uh, wood commerce uh, and so on. My um, grandfather, who was in some way a black sheep of the family, uh, was among the socialists who became atheist and so on at the turn of the century. And he uh, was so much involved in political activity that uh, around 1905 he had to escape to Paris. Uh, where he arrived without any knowledge of French, without any knowledge of whatever. I am uh, maybe not going too much into that because well, we, we me, risk to, uh, let, to spend here weeks. I, I, I love that story that you told o over lunch last week. So I'll, I'll ask you no. to even be, begin by the circumstances how when your, your grandfather was in the bathroom and so on. If you tell that story. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I can, I can tell you the story. Uh, well, my grandfather is a young man. He was married. And uh, the elder brother of my uh, father was then a baby. I think that it was a moment of some massive arrests of socialists, of Jewish socialists in Vilna. The police came to arrest him. He was in his shirt sleeves at home uh, when they realized that the police was ringing uh, at the door. He rushed to the uh, bathroom and the way he was, w without a penny on him or any papers on him, without even a jacket, he went through the window on, an, on the roof of the building and from that roof to another roof and from there he succeeded to get to the street and from there he succeeded to rush to the railway station and jump on the train that was already moving. And when he was on that train, he realized that he was uh, on a train that was going to Paris. Now he had no money with him, he had no papers and so on. So he, su he succeeded to hide in the train for two days and then he arrived to Paris. He, no ticket, no paper, no control of the frontier. In the frontiers, he was on the roof, I guess, of the wagon and so on. And then he arrived uh, to Paris. He arrived to Paris. He came out from the train. And then to his great relief, he saw people with dark eyes, dark hair, Jewish types, and so on. So he started, of course, immediately to, to talk to the people in Yiddish. And the Frenchman looked at him, uh, said, who is this strange character who bubbles this strange language and so on. He was amazed. But one of those French, or those Jews, he thought they were Jews, 
was he really a Jew? And he answered to him in Yiddish. And so he explained his particular situation, that he was hungry, he was dirty, he was cold, and so on. That man told him, look, you must go to the Rue de Rosier. Rue de Rosier is a, is a street of, 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 of Jews. And there they speak Yiddish, and they will understand you, and you'll find something to do. So he went to Rue de Rosier, and he, he knocked on a few doors, and he found a tailor who was a nice man who took him in, who asked him if he knew how to sew buttons. He said he did not, but he would learn. And this is how he started his career of survival in Paris. And after some time, just putting the pennies together, he succeeded to make my grandmother come to Paris with a, with a baby. And, um, and then after a couple of years, when my grandmother was pregnant with my father and she was going to give birth to the child, she was so afraid to, to, to give birth to the child in, in Paris, which was, after all, such a, such a cold and difficult city for, 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 for Jews who came from that side of, of, of Europe. The family succeeded in Vilna to, to, to buy some uh, police officers and to, to make the, uh, the evidence against my grandfather disappear and so on. And somehow the ground was cleared and they were able to come back. And my father was born then in Vilna, uh, I think a very short time after their return. Tell us, uh, pick up the story, if you will, um, from when they returned. From when, when uh, they returned to Vilna? Well, when they returned to Vilna, my grandfather had a problem in his relationship with his family. They did certainly not approve of his becoming a socialist did not approve of the problems he created for them, and so on. Well, I can well understand uh, it was only in later years that I realized how difficult it was to be a Jew in, 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 in under the, the, the Tsarist regime or under the Polish regime, where, where the enormous Jewish population was very discriminated and, and was... Uh, had to, 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 to comply with uh, very difficult realities. So for them to be involved with, uh, with, um, with the police and all that was something that uh, they, they somehow felt he was responsible of having created for the whole family a lot of problems. And I think that the relationships were not very good. And he had somehow to survive. But he was a very imaginative man. And he decided to open um, Taylor's Salon, and he decided to make it in grand style, and he opened something which was called uh, Partnois Parisia, which meant uh, uh, the tailor from Paris. He didn't know how to sew, he didn't know how to do anything, but he found some tailors, local tailors, and so on. He was a very handsome, a very elegant man, so he was the one who was giving the chic to the whole thing. And then they have even expanded this salon of couture uh, when my grandmother decided also to make a part for ladies. My grandmother was also a very, very good looking woman, very pretty, she used to dress very well and so on, and it gave also a chic to, 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 to the ladies part of the salon. And, um, my grandmother had this idea of launching a fashion of a certain fabric that according to what she was saying then was the latest uh, uh, invention of Paris, of Paris fashion, which was a material that was called, I think, fruasse or something like that. Um, and she had a lot of success with it. The, 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 the Vilna ladies were crazy about the thing because it really made them feel that they are dressed like the beautiful women of Paris. Now, actually, what my grandmother was selling was an invention that she bought from some beggar in Vilna who one day brought her some pieces of wood and two irons, and he has shown to her how to 
how to put some fabric between the wood and how to put those iron and, and heat them and it would give a very special effect. So my poor grandmother had to prepare all these things at night when nobody would see. Uh, and um, even, even I think the dressmakers who worked for her, they were sure that those, that those uh, silks with this very special effect were coming from abroad, while she was producing them every night, <laughs> poor woman, <laughs> in the kitchen of the house. So for a few years she worked uh, like that, but when, mm, when I was born and so on, I still remember very well my grandfather's salon, and he had also some furs then, and my grandmother wasn't working anymore. I, I think that the whole story of the Fcuasse was, uh, was passé. Good. Tell us about your parents, about the kind of people they were, the kind of home that you were raised in. Well, uh, my parents, I think, belonged to, um, to, to, to what you would call the, the, the worldly generation. I mean, they were not uh, people who were very much uh, involved in their religion or the tradition, the Jewish tradition. They were, uh, they were this younger generation of the, of the so-called worldly Jews. Later years, I realized that Vilna was very complex. You had various uh, uh, groups, from the very orthodox to the to the socialists, to the bourgeoisie, to 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 Jewish snobbery, to um, people who had a very um, strong national feeling of Judaism. Uh, my parents, actually, I would say, were somewhere in between. They were in between. They were not really of the assimilated people. I don't think that they were great snobs because they admitted that Yiddish was a beautiful language while the real Jewish snobs were calling Yiddish not Yiddish but jargon and they would not speak Yiddish. But nevertheless, my parents had for me a Polish governess not from Vilna but from Krakow, because in Krakow they spoke a more beautiful Polish, and I was supposed to lose that accent, you know, that would, uh, that would uh, somehow show that I am from Vilna, which in Polish standards was a provincial town. Uh, my mother was a very modern woman. She felt that the woman had to be independent and had to work. So she worked, she worked as an accountant, and uh, my father had, with a friend of his who was a dentist, they had, um, they had a um, dentist office specialized mainly in the reconstruction of teeth and, uh, and so on. Um, my father was a very, uh, a very handsome and very elegant man who looked upon his wife's uh, need for independence and modernism, I think, with a little, with a little cynical view. He, it was very important for him that my mother is very well-dressed and very elegant. Now, my mother felt that she had to buy her things with the money that she gains herself. It was, a, it was, it was a, a moral question, besides the fact, of course, that the fact that she had to work meant that at home there was a cook and there was a, a maid and there was a, a governess and so on. But then my father had a secret agreement with some shops of hat makers and shoes and so on that whenever my mother would come they would sell her some exceptional deals of some things that came from Warsaw and so on that costed about a third and so on and uh, my mother never knew it. All. It came out years later. It was when we were in the DP camp, I think, that my mother met a, a woman where she used to buy hats. And that woman told her, but you know, your husband was always 
paying us the difference of the price <laughs> that you were paying, <laughs> thinking that you were buying some very cheap things. So this was my mother. But my mother was a very exceptional woman. She was a very courageous, she was a very courageous woman. She was um, a very talented artist. She did, I think, about a couple of years of art school. And this made it maybe uh, more easy for me to get into, into this concept of being, of being an artist. Uh, I think that if I'm sitting here and if I can talk today and if I can ta talk and, 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 and tell of all this world, it is very much thanks to the fact that I had very courageous, incredibly courageous parents. Uh, I think this is maybe what, what I really remember about them, is this incredible courage. In the most difficult circumstances, uh, they somehow succeeded to survive. But I also remember them, I remember them as, 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 very, as very beautiful people. I remember, for instance, as a child, I loved to see them go out in the evening. I loved to see them dress up. My father in the tuxedo and my mother in an evening gown and so on. And I knew they will go out, and I knew they will come late, and I knew that I'm going to, let, to, 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 to make them pay for it, because whenever they came out back late, I used to yell and to cry and to owl and so on, and they had always to transport me in my bed into their bedroom. But uh, at the same time, I, I loved to see them go out. I think this was, this was really, at that time, it was, of course, before the war and so on, Maybe this were, these were the most glorious moments to see my, my mother and my father like a queen and a king uh, got into the world, being beautiful. Are there any stories, fables, myths that you remember that you were told as a child? Any particular fable stories? Well, there is, uh, there is quite an extraordinary, or I would say, a chain of stories from um, the side of um, my uh, mother's grandparents. Now, let me begin somewhere in the middle of, of, of last century. My uh, great-grandfather, Shmuel, who died at an age of certainly over 90, a couple of weeks before I was born, and I carry his name. Now, he was married off at his bar mitzvah. He was married off at his bar mitzvah to a girl who was 14, simply because this was the only way to keep him from going into the Tsar's army. And at that time, they were taking Jewish boys into the army for a service of 25 years. So, the only way not to go to the army was to be married. And my uh, great-grandfather was married off at his bar mitzvah, this is when a Jew can actually marry, to a girl of 14. And when the bar mitzvah was over, the parents told him, now you go back home. He said, what do you mean I go back home? It's written in the Bible that I leave my parents and I go with my wife. He called the rabbi and he said, what are my parents telling me to do? And the rabbi said, he's right. He has to go with his wife. Well, about nine months later, he was a father. And this is when the first of his about 25 or 30 children that he had was born. He was the father at the age of 14. Now, I, in the 70 years that he was producing children, he was married about three times. Um, he lived a little out of town. And his specialty was the healing of animals. Now, he was a healer of animals. He used to write magical prayers that the peasants who had sick uh, cows or sick uh, horses and so on would uh, let them swallow down and so on with the hope that this is how he survived. He was a poor man. And his problem were the children. How can he bring up so many children? Every year there was one child born, 
And when I'm speaking of about 25 or 30 children, I think that at least 20 children were alive, were really grew up, so many more were born. So there was a pr problem that he has solved in a way that whenever a child was about seven or eight years old, he would bring them to Vilna and put them with somebody in town working as an apprentice. So when my grandfather and his sister, who were very closely related, uh, I think one was about seven and the other one was eight, were brought to Vilna, th my great-grandfather has put my grandfather into the home of a blind mechanician, mechanic, how do you say? I think you say mechanic, a blind mechanic who was then very known in town because this blind mechanic was uh, responsible for the safes of banks. And this was my other great-grandfather, because subsequently this little boy married the daughter of this blind man. And he has put the girl, the sister of my grandfather, in a family of a baker. Now, uh, the little girl had a very, very hard time, very hard time. That baker had lots of babies and uh, they were employing the, this, it was, it was like in Dickens, it must have been uh, children's slave labor. They were employing these children to clean and wash and, 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 uh, and do the most difficult work and this little girl was very unhappy in the, in the baker's place. So the only moments of relief for her were when the baker was sending over the cakes that he was doing to the palace of the Count Tishkevich, who was of the Polish Lachta that were uh, recognized to some, in some way by the, by the Tsar as being part of the aristocracy and so on. And uh, this little girl, was seen by a childless couple of the Polish aristocracy that was part of the court of the Count Tyszkiewicz and so on. And they started to be very interested in this little girl and they thought that it would be a nice thing maybe to take this little girl, adopt her and bring her up as their own child. So about a year later, this is what happened. One day, this little girl went from the baker's shop to uh, the palace and she never came back. How old was 